All right, 6.31 p.m. on Monday, November 16th, called Board of Selectmen meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being recorded uh, and uh, minutes are being taken by Gail Hunter. Uh, okay, so I don't have any real announcements for this evening. Uh, I'm gonna ask if anybody has any comments on anything that is not on the agenda tonight. If so, raise your hand and I'll recognize you briefly. Not seeing anybody. So um, our first item on the agenda is a public hearing for the fiscal year 21, 2021 tax classification. Uh, I'd like a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor, roll call vote, Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right, uh, so this is the um, public hearing, the annual public hearing for setting the tax classification. It doesn't set the tax rate, it just sets the um, sets some parameters for how we establish um, the tax rates in town. Um, we do this every year uh, and it starts out with a presentation from the assessors on the process and the information that's been presented to the town. So, Jenny Thompson, uh, you're up. Good evening, everyone. Um, the selectmen, you've all received the packet that I put together. Um, it's a lot of information, but I'm just gonna quickly run through it. Um, the first page is just a lot of informational, um, you know, what's happened with the value, the tax, proposed tax rate, um, average single family, median single family, average residential, commercial industrial, uh, taxable, average taxable, the median, what's gonna happen with the average tax uh, bill, um, which I'm happy to say that this year, it's, it'll be an increase in value, but the tax uh, bill itself would only go up about $48. That's the lowest we've seen in a long, long time. So um, growth has the growth amount for the year. We did get a little more than we had last year, which is good. Uh, total value, total taxable value of the town went up $181 million. Uh, we're now at $2.69 billion. Um, total with exempt is now almost $2.9 billion. We're at $2.894. Uh, so a lot of information. You can review um, all of that on your own. Um, the next page is just a protected, um, projected revenue based on the value by class and the tax rate and what uh, part of the levy will be pulled in by each class, the residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. We have no open space. Um, the next page is just gives you a little, um, shows what the sh uh, shift would do if we decided to, if the board decided to shift to commercial, uh, put more work for the commercial, industrial, personal property classes. Um, you can see what happens with the tax rates. The residentials, of course, would, would go down, but not really too much. And the, um, the commercial would go up by actually quite a bit. Um, and they would be picking up a lot of the burden based on what percentage you can go up. We can go up to 150%. Um, the next page shows the same thing based on average um, residential, what would happen, how much the, um, the average uh, residential property would save in money if you shifted <laughs> based on that percentage and what would happen with the commercial and um, then the commercial industrial. The next page is for residential exemption, which people, uh, the only people that qualify for residential exemption are properties that the people um, that are owner occupied. Um, so everyone else uh, would end up with a higher, the tax rate would shift because of the difference for the people that were getting a discount. And so the, the tax rate would increase, which may, would be the same as though you're shifting the burden um, the other way, shifting it from to commercial industrial. We have no open space, so we don't do a discount. 
because there's nothing to discount. And the last page is the small uh, commercial exemption, which it's only for prop, uh, businesses that are 10 um, employees or under. We get a list from the state every year. This year, the list contained 147 businesses and only 25 of them would qualify. Um, there's requirements as far as valuation. If it's a million or more, they don't qualify. If it's a, say like a strip mall or whatever, everybody in that would have to qualify in order to give, get the benefit. So, um, and you can go up to a 10% exemption and that's what I based the information on. The Board of Assessors voted to recommend a single tax rate, no residential exemption, and no commercial, small commercial exemption. And they are asking the Board of Selectmen to, uh, to vote that way also. So now I just need a motion from somebody to do those three things <laughs> in a second, and then uh, I'll be all done. Or questions, if anybody has questions. So, so what we're going to do now is we're going to ask if there's any questions from members of the board. Then we'll ask if any members of the public have any questions. Then we'll close the evidentiary portion of the public hearing um, and take a motion out of vote. Members of the board. I had one, but it got answered, so I'm all set. I like those, Becky. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Jeff? Uh, as usual, Jenny, this is really clear, and thank you for all your work putting this together. Um, You're welcome. I have no other questions. Thank you. <clears throat> and Harrison. I have to say no questions. Sorry thank for you. taking up so much time. <laughs> John Rao. I don't have any questions either, Eli. A lot of information here. I'm, I'm relying uh, in part certainly on the assessors and their recommendation. They're certainly much closer to the numbers than we are. Um, uh, I ordinarily have no questions. I do have one small question this year. Was there any discussion about the small business exemption and whether or not there is any benefit to having it in light of uh, uh, impact on businesses this year due to COVID? We didn't discuss that in part because, like I said, only 25 of them would qualify. So everybody else would, it, it wouldn't benefit at all. And it would end up causing uh, the other ones to pay more. So we just don't feel it's, um, you know, the, the way that we try, we did help the commercial this year is there really wasn't a lot of change in valuation at all. And, and with this proposed tax rate of going down, the commercial properties will see a drop in their taxes. Uh, that's right. For members of the public who are not really clear on that, uh, uh, because the valuations in town went up, the actual tax rate overall is going to go down this year a little bit. Um, so some people will get a, um, a tax break. All right. Any members of the public have any questions? Uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll let you be recognized. All right, not seeing anybody, so I will take a motion to close the evidentiary portion of the public hearing. I'll move. So, second. second. So that was four. Close enough. <laughs> so that was uh, Becky and uh, Jeff. All right, any discussion? Roll call vote, Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bodmer Turner. This is a roll call vote on closing the evidentiary portion. That is correct. Yes. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right, so now um, we can do this as one motion uh, uh, if we want. We've done it in the, in the past years, but I'm fine with it as a one, and I think uh, Ginny is fine with it as one as well. So the motion would be to approve um, a single tax rate for the town with no, approve the recommendation of the Board of Assessors that there be a single tax rate in town with no residential exemption and no small business exemption. Are you happy with that um, uh, uh, motion? So moved. 
Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bummer Turner? Yes. Mr. Round? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right. So thank you um, uh, once again, Jenny. Um, You're welcome. And I want to thank the board for all the support over the past 25 years. I may not be doing this next year because I'm retiring October 1st. <laughs> I, I don't think that's oh. allowed, Jenny. Yeah. No. No. So I'll believe it no. when I see it. There's okay. <laughs> Jenny, you you missed yeah, it. Jenny. October first has already happened. <laughs> right. You're on forever. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item number two on the agenda. This is uh, joint interviews for an appointment for an interim library trustee. We had uh, uh, one of our trustees uh, for many years were, uh, uh, resigned from the board and uh, we need to replace him. And that will ultimately be a vote, um, a joint vote between the uh, library board of trustees and the board of selectmen. Tonight, we're going to be interviewing three candidates. Um, uh, and uh, taking questions from uh, library trustees and uh, members of the board of selectmen. And then we will uh, have a vote at our next meeting for who will be the replacement trustee filling out the term of Mr. Shaw. Um, and then that person would, uh, the, uh, would presumably run um, uh, for the next term. All right, the three people up are Kate Lawrence, Dave Lumsden, and Marcy Johnson. We had also Melanie Oldman on the list, but she has withdrawn her application. So uh, let's start with Kate Lawrence. Uh, if you would unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us about yourself. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, wait, hold on one, one moment. Um, I, I remembered uh, Rick Rogers uh, had wanted to make a couple of comments before we got going on this. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Hey, guys. Um, so, hi, everyone. Rick Rogers. I'm the chairman of the Library Trustees Board. So, I wanted to make a couple of quick statements. One is really more of a statement. The other is just something to consider as you answer the, uh, the Board of Selectmen's questions tonight. Um, so, first off, so something you may not be aware of as you enter into considering the library board of trustees is that the library trustees, there's a separate fund of money that's been held aside um, under the Library Foundation Trust, which is a 501c3 organization. Uh, for the betterment of the library long term, uh, looking at buying property, building new new buildings, that sorts of thing long term, right? So um, as we looked at the, the plans for the library over the next 10, 20, 30 years, decades sort of thing, right? We wanted to be able to be in a position to help the town build a new library whenever that became an option. Um, so this trust was set up and there is some money held in reserve in this trust against that objective. Um, so this is 501c3 organization is a private organization, private company, and we would ask whoever joins the library board of trustees to also become a board member of that trust. Um, it's all organized with the town, all of that. There's, you know, we, we set up conflict of interest forms and whatever else, so that you're, as managing the library board, um, the budget for the library, also managing this sort of long-term aspect with this foundation is part of that aspect. So I'm happy to talk to you, any of all, any or all of you about that, um, we can take a couple quick questions tonight if you need to. I don't want to take too much of the selectmen's time, but um, I just wanted you to be aware that this is something that we would hope for the new appointee to be part of as they join the trustees. Um, it really doesn't conflict with anything that you do as part of a trustee, but just wanted you to be aware it is a separate commitment. Secondly, um, so Sarah, Dot, and I, as we've kind of thought about what do we are looking for from a trustee moving forward, 
you know, everyone, you know, what you're going to talk about tonight is sort of why you want to be a trustee. Um, you know, I have to give lots of credit to Sarah and her staff and her team right now. Right? The library staff is a, a few people from the town that are probably the most visible among all town employees, right? So, um, as we think about what are we looking for from a trustee, what is it that you think you can bring to this board and this town, not just long term and not just in managing the budget, but you know, how would you hope to help the library manage through this transition time where it's really difficult to be the front face of the town, but also have to shut your doors, right? So. Um, as you, can th as you think about that um, and your skills and what you hope to bring to the library trustees, I'd, I'd like you to, to be able to address the conversation of not thinking so much long-term and not so much thinking about budget, but what is it you would hope to be able to bring to the library that we can help to serve the town better as we manage this really difficult time? So those are my comments. Um, again, I'm happy to talk to anyone and all of you anytime all week in the next couple of weeks as we go through this process of selecting the next trustee. Thanks, Eli. Uh, I'll see the floor back. All righty. So um, now, Ms. Lawrence, you um, can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you. And thank you all for hosting us this evening. It's nice to meet you and see everyone. <clears throat> my name is Kate Lawrence, and my husband Dan and I moved to Manchester with our two children four and a half years ago. And the first thing we did when we moved to town is the first thing we do when we go anywhere, and that is to go to the library, the public library, get a library card and introduce ourselves to that, that center of learning uh, and literacy and community. And uh, I work at Akamai Solutions downtown. Uh, I, I had a group of almost 100 people in our user experience division. And before that, I worked at EBSCO in, in, in Ipswich. And my love of libraries uh, has been a lifelong uh, entity for me, but also certainly understanding how the library world works and technology and libraries and the future of libraries. I got a very, got the inner workings of during my time at EBSCO. I look forward to answering your questions and uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me introduce myself. All right, uh, board members, I guess uh, I'll go in order. Let's go with um, uh, Becky first. Hi, Kate. Thank you very much for um, <clears throat> volunteering. Uh, we, we are very fortunate in this town that we have so many people who love to jump in and help things move along. Um, given what Rick just said, um, what do you feel would be the biggest strength that you could bring to the library and would you also have time to be able to um, uh, volunteer for um, the other organization, the financial one? Uh, yes, I would have time. I'd certainly lo love to understand the commitment for uh, the second organization and I believe in the purpose of it. And I am also part at work of the Akamai Foundation. So I understand how those can work in parallel and how to move both uh, the, the business of the library and also the possibility and the, and the possibility and the, the future vision of a new library space and uh, forward. So having said that, what I think I bring to this that is unique is my training is that of a researcher. So I understand, I understand how to assess a situation, get the feedback we need, distill findings, distill information into an actionable strategic plan to move forward. I'm very good at separating what I would call the noise from the signals. And it's important to pick up on those cues or signals and be able to draw from those and understand what are those signals that allow us to understand how to proceed and how to chart the North Star and then make our course through a vision, a mission, and values as we do that and we remain true to the library mission and true to the values of the community and the town. 
coming out of COVID is going to be very challenging. And one of the expressions we use quite a bit in user experience and research is meeting people, meeting users where they are. And where people are in this community, that's something that we're going to have to measure, do a little research on, get feedback, and hear how people want to engage with the library, what they're needing, what are their current pain points, and design programming and engagement strategies around that. Did I, did I answer your question? <laughs> I hope so. You absolutely did. Thank you very much, Kate. That's it for me um, for now. Okay, Mr. Bob Turner. What you just described is a fairly high level approach to um, our little library in our little burg. And um, my uh, question to you is, uh, what do you see as the um, most important aspects of development that the library needs to address in the next five years? I was thinking about this earlier and over the weekend, and I was actually discussing this with my husband because he and I spend a lot of time, we've spent time in the Manchester Library and other libraries, both here in Massachusetts and also around the world through my job at EBSCO, I was able to travel. And there are some, there are some common elements that are faced by many libraries. Certainly active engagement is one. And I go back to what I just answered in the previous question around meeting people where they are. And it is about curating a program that is going to appeal to people and patrons of all ages. So certainly a diversity is important. Accessibility is also very important. We need to make sure that everyone feels not only welcome at the library, but able to access the content and the services that the library has to offer. I also think that the library plays a very important role in the development of parental advocacy in their children's literacy and education. And all of these things that I'm describing certainly center around the family. There's also the library of things, the internet of things. There are creative ways to engage people in the community, whether that's um, having different kinds of devices and uh, mechanisms on loan, such as scooters or beekeeping materials I've been reading about for other libraries. There's lots of creative ways to approach new programming. And I think one of the things I, I'm uniquely qualified to bring to the role is I'm connected to the world in technology and other ways that I can bring in some of those best practices and innovative ideas. So how does that translate into priorities for the next five years? Okay. Uh, I saw the mission statement on the library, on the library website and there's an exercise that I'm familiar with that I've done at every job I've ever had called for a VSEM. And a VSEM is when you take, the, you take the mission or you take the vision, you break it down into components. And the components are strategy, execution, and measurement. And so we need to figure out if this is the North Star, here are the steps that are gonna take us there. And it is working through those individual steps and then looking at outcomes and measuring and evaluating if you got the outcome you wanted and if you didn't, how you might try a new path or a new experiment and pivot slightly again towards that same vision. Does that Thank help answer you. your question? Okay. Mr. Round. Yes, thank you, Eli, and uh, thank you, Kate, for uh, raising your hand. You need so many people to raise their hands in town, and we are very fortunate that we have quite a few people that do. Um, a couple of the key questions I think you already answered. The key questions were certainly posed by um, the previous questioners. Um, one thing that I might, might ask, I know that you've been a volunteer in several other organizations and your recent or perhaps not so recent past. And I, I can see a lot of connection between your professional pursuits 
and how that fits with applying that to the library challenges here. Um, with these other organizations, and a, a lot of them may be not too unsimilar. I mean, you know, volunteer situations in, in small towns, and I don't know if you came from a small town before, but um, have you learned anything from there that you think is going to be applicable to here? Because again, you're dealing with a small community, just a few people, it's not a, a work situation, but um, uh, is there something that uh, you feel you could apply from what you've learned there to the trustees position? I like the question because my answer is that this trustee role is that of a steward of the library and in support of Sarah uh, as the library director and working in concert and working as a part of a larger community ecosystem is what's important. And in any role I've had, volunteer, professional, even you know, roles in families, when you're a part of that ecosystem, it's the development of relationships that are critical and investing in the relationships, understanding that this role as a trustee is as an aggregate, it is not to further you know, individual opinions or wishes, it is to work on behalf of not only the board of trustees, the library as whole as a community institution and with other institutions in that community ecosystem is very important. And so, you know, in my career over my lifetime, I understand the value of developing relationships because that is how influence is, that is how influence is, is gained. That is how, when you're advocating for something or you're looking for funding or you're hoping to get a grant for something, it's through the relationships, it's through the influence, it's through the goodwill that, that those relationships generate that you can see progress being made. So that's, that's how, that's a, a strategy that's worked for me. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Harrison. I'm, I'm going to push this into the very concrete. Um, some years ago, I was on the school committee and I was very much aware that, that the relationship between the school library and the town library was not as cooperative as it could be. Do you have any thoughts about that, their, their territoriality? When I've been faced with relationships that have reached a level of complexity that prevents progress from being made, I have found solutions in the form of a mediator or a monitor, a moderator. And this person does not have to be someone, you know, we pay, we're not, we don't have to pay someone from the mediation project. But I have found bringing in a separate, bringing in a third party and the third party could be another person in the community, et cetera, to sit down individually with different entities, understand, to listen, to hear them out, to understand where the pain points are, where the points of negotiation might be, where also identify points of compromise, and then bring people together for a mediated session. I've seen some really, truly complex uh, situations become resolved when people commit first to work with that third party and then to sit down and work it through. And I've felt the moments of tension. I have seen them resolve enough so in that format that I, I have hope that it can work. I will tell you that that my belief is that that needs to be a strong relationship and I would look forward to um, helping facilitate that in any way that I could. I understand of the different library types, certainly a school library and a public library need to be in a strong partnership. So I think that's an investment worth making and I would look to further that. Thank you. No more questions. Um, my questions have also been answered, asked already by a um, combination of Jeff and Becky and answered. So uh, do any uh, library trustees have any questions they want to ask of um, uh, Ms. Lawrence? Uh, 
Uh, this is Rick. No, I don't. Um, Sarah or Dot. Okay. So um, uh, thank you, Ms. Lawrence, and uh, move on to Thanks, the next Dave. person. And uh, uh, let's see here. So uh, next up is uh, David Lumsden. Uh, David, if you could unmute yourself and. Uh, Unmuted. Hi, hey, everyone. Hi, David. I am uh, delighted to be part of this very talented group. This must be the uh, most sought after political position in town. So I'm privileged and honored to be part of this group. I'm a library fan from way, way back from childhood days. Um, a little history about myself. I think most of you all know me. Uh, but as you probably know, um, we moved here in 1984. Uh, two children were raised, went to school here. Um, their librarian at the time was Dot. Their children's librarian is Sarah, was Sarah. And uh, thanks to their good tutelage, uh, my son now has an MBA and he's a, a partner in a hedge fund in San Francisco. And my daughter, who's an MD down at Duke, um, Medical Center just finished her master's degree in global health as well. I attribute the library to a big part of that accomplishment and achievement. The reason I want to run for this trustee as a trustee, uh, and, and oh, let me give you a little background about my, my work history too. Perhaps that'll help. I started with a small medical diagnostic company in Indiana. Um, many 47 years ago uh, a few dozen people good scientists and over time the company grew built was purchased first by miles then by Siemens as a part of that work that I did we not only expanded our medical diagnostic test but we also expanded our connectivity so that if a test would be t done, let's say in a small lab connected with partner's hospital in a doctor's office or in a small clinic, uh, the, the one down in Danvers, that particular test would now be sent from a Siemens medical diagnostic piece of equipment, pregnancy test, a diabetes test, a COVID-19 test would be, could be sent to the pathologist at Mass General and read at any time. I read immediately. My job as part of Siemens was to educate not only the professionals, but the business side of, of the, uh, these enterprises, as well as the distributors that sold these products on behalf of Siemens. So my talents, if I'm asked, I think I'm very good at communication, cooperation with people, very different backgrounds, education, skill levels, in achieving strategic goals and um, obtaining financial objectives. I love libraries. Uh, I think I'd be very good at this. That's enough, I, I'll wait for your questions. All right, Ms. Jakes, uh, you're up. Thank you. Hi, David, it's very nice to see you. Um, I've known David for many, many years. Yeah. So um, I guess um, I know you are active in the town and um, would you have time for both the trustee as well as the financial organization I in addition to conservation commission? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I would relish uh, both roles in, in, the, in the library because I have plans in, for using both roles in the future five-year plan of the library. Um, yes, I do have time. I re as you probably know, Becky, JJ knows, I retired in January and um, I've still got plenty of energy. I'm looking for things to do and I can't think of a better project than to help build our library. Well, and you've known it for a long time. Thank you, David. 
Thank you, Becky. Uh, Mr. Round. Yes, David, how are you doing? Hi, John. Good. Well, thank you for raising your hand. You've probably raised your hand more than just about anybody else in town over the past 30 years or so. You've done, you've done so much. I hope your shoulder's not getting sore. But uh, <laughs> shifting over to this uh, library role, and you, you bring, I guess, uh, a, a slightly different perspective in the sense that you've been active with the library now for a couple of, well, for several years. Right. And uh, you're active with the Friends of the Library now. So you, you know more probably about the inner workings personally than, than most people because you've, you've interfaced with it. Um, what do you see right now as kind of uh, the biggest challenge that the library is uh, facing given what you know? I think two challenges. First of all, this library is very popular thanks to the great staff and, and uh, the directors of the library. The, the trustees have done a great job. The staff is wonderful. Sarah, Rachel, and Carol have done a fabulous job. And let me give you an example of the fabulous job that they've done and then what I think we need to do for the future. Here's a copy of last week's KPN Beacon uh, from uh, Friday, November 13th. It lists the three local libraries in the area and the activities, the promotions, the, the, the activities that they are, are advertising as available right now. These are special activities. So your free library in Gloucester lists two extracurricular activities. The, the Rockport Library has listed two extra special uh, activities that week. Manchester Public Library has listed 10 activities. These are over and above what we're normally doing to deal with COVID right now. One of those activities was the, um, the book sale that was just held on Friday. And to answer Rick's question, I delivered today 137 DVDs and CDs to the Nancy Hammond and the Council of Aging, and those are to be distributed uh, to folks that might be interested in that. Older technology, frankly, I wish we'd given 137 lessons on how to use Libby and Overdrive in order to obtain online uh, audios that are available. Hopefully we can do that in the future. Library usage is down across the country. It, it's popular still in Manchester, although to tell you the truth, I don't think my kids lose, use library services very much. What about yours? I, if my daughter-in-law wants to per get a book, she purchases from Amazon. It's quick, it's easy, and it's fast. I would like for us to have quick, easy, and fast online services. I think we need to spur innovation, particularly on the digital format, as much as possible. And Kate, I recognize you have that capability and um, I'm sure Marcy, you do too. I feel like I do as well. And I certainly would seek to do that. I think another thing we need to do is rethink our library space. It's inadequate, totally inadequate. Um, we need to expand the space and we need the state's help to do it. And I've got a plan to do it, which I think could double our space and at the same time, not depend on the town to finance it. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harrison. Muted. I really have no more no more questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Bodmer Turner. So David, um, did I just understand that you said you were going to underwrite the doubling of the uh, <laughs> Manchester Public Library? Um, because you have a plan that's not going to cost us a penny? I like that plan already, even though <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, 
Uh, it's pretty simple math. The, the state will underwrite 60% of the cost for any library expansion projects that are approved by the state under $3 million. If we could acquire Regina Villa's property, the neighbors, and add an addition and keep the total cost under $3 million, the state will come up with 60% of $3 million. That's $1,800,000. 40% would have to come from the library or from the town. That's $1,200,000. The Friends of the Library, of which I'm a member, have $200,000. The trustees, as Rick said, have, have money as well. And I don't think it's going to be a big problem to get some major <laughs> donors to contribute to an expansion of the library that could possibly have their name on it for the next 150 years. So have you run this by Regina? <laughs> yes, Regina is on the board um, at the meeting house with me. We've been friends for years. She told me about two months ago, which I've sh shared this with some of you all, she is willing to sell the property. Sarah, that's a change. She's now willing to sell the property to the library. In fact, she would prefer to sell the, the property to the library. I think it has to be done within the next five years. Regina's in her mid eighties. Yeah. I have no further questions. That was, um, that was a very interesting segue into uh, the planning question that I had. So I have no other questions because I'm afraid of what you're gonna come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. David, one quick question for you. So you're currently a member of the um, uh, Friends of the Library. Yes. Um, my understanding, uh, and I wanted to clarify this with you, and uh, if anybody wants to correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, there needs to be a bit of a firewall between Friends of the Library and the library proper. So if you were on the Board of Trustees, you would have to come off of Friends of the Library. Do you understand that? Yes, and so do the Friends. <laughs> Yeah, I'm vice, I'm vice president of the Friends right now. They do understand that. Uh, I've just appointed two new members to the Friends, um, Meredith Tuss and uh, Jim O'Neill. So hopefully uh, one of the veterans or either one of those two will, will step into my role. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I have no other, other questions. Uh, um, do members of the uh, library trustees have any questions? I found my unmute button. My question okay. is for all three candidates and I'm very happy to see such interest in the position is have you any, had any experience working on a municipal government? And it's quite a bit of a different experience than the public sector or uh, nonprofit organizations. So it's a bit of a learning curve when new people come on the board. So before you answer, um, so Kate Lawrence didn't get a chance to answer that question because uh, Dot was muted and couldn't unmute to ask it before. So what we'll do is we'll <laughs> pick the answer first from Dave Lumsden and then we'll go back and catch Kate Lawrence. Thank you. Answer. And then when we interview uh, Marcy, uh, we'll follow up and get that question from her. Dave, go ahead. Uh, am I starting? You are. Kate? You're starting. Okay, so uh, Dad, I would ask you, can you define that? What do you mean? Do you mean working as an employee for a municipal? No, there are many uh, laws, uh, open uh, meeting laws, uh, many ways you can trip yourself up and get into a lot of trouble, especially oh. your plan for that new building. In the oh, state. I see what you're saying. <laughs> okay, well, I, you know, it wouldn't be my plan. I, first of all, I'd go to the um, this, as you know, I, I don't have to tell you all, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners has two full-time um, library construction managers. It's their job to structure and organize a study to see what has to be done for library expansions. And, it, and it's their job to um, come up with conclusions and, and uh, set the guidelines and each of the um, hurdles that need to be accomplished in order to obtain this funding. They, at, 
and, and none of us have any illusions about this. It's a long process. It can take five years or more, even more reason why it should begin right away. Does that answer your question? Well, it's more about uh, how in a, in a meeting, you know, it always has to be open. The doors have to be open. You can't oh. just uh, oh. be talking about the library down at the local coffee shop. It's not the oh. same as the Friends of the Library or other types of uh, oh. volunteer positions you may have had. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yes. Well, to answer your question, I, I was on the school committee for three years. That answers my question. <laughs> yeah, and I was on uh, the housing board for 10 years. I was chairman of the, of the housing board for five years, including- uh, Here I am, hi. Okay, I understand that, that, that really answers my question, yes. Okay. You know how to work with the town hall. Right. Okay, Lauren, so I'll pick you up on this question. Thank you. Um, thank you for asking the question. I do not have experience uh, in, in a municipal governance position. I will tell you that I understand how the practice of confidentiality, diplomacy, um, and would apply here and why they would need to and that I would have to learn the brass tacks of how to do that. So absolutely, this would be, uh, that piece of it would be new to me and I would be an attentive, diligent student in that regard. Thank you. Sure. Um, and Marcy, we're gonna, we're gonna catch you in, in when we do your full interview on this this particular question. Other members of the uh, uh, trustee of the library have any questions for Mr. Lemson? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. Right, thank you, David. I'm going to move on now to um, Marcy Johnson. So Marcy, if you could unmute yourself uh, and uh, same spiel, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Marcy. I moved to Manchester in September um, from Beverly Farms. And before that I was in New Orleans. Um, I've taught at Brookwood for the last eight years as an after school teacher and all of my classes are based on children's literature. So everything from Magic Treehouse to Harry Potter to Percy Jackson. Um, I do arts and crafts and curriculum all designed around movement, music, um, kids books. And I'm also a novelist and writer. Um, I have two mystery books um, out. I have a new book of nonfiction essays about to come out. Hugely passionate about the library. The minute I moved to New England, um, the first thing I did was go to the Manchester Library, which I just was enchanted by. Um, so um, when I got the, when I saw that you all were looking for a trustee, I'm like, oh my God, yes, I would love to do anything to help the library. Um, I worked on, a, I, I was on a couple of boards in New Orleans for the Waldorf School and for um, the Abiona House, which was a, a preschool there. And I also have spent the last like six, seven years um, working with the PBD Essex Museum. Um, I just most recently worked on their Million Dollar Gala. Um, I love, um, I love being really creative and coming up with ideas for fun ways to make money. I absolutely love all the innovative things libraries are doing all over to connect with their communities. I also worked with the MFA as a patron on their fashion council. Um, as I am an artist, I love, I love connecting with artists and really, oh my God, I had so many. Um, I, I'm, I saw that Manchester Library is doing story walks, which I just adore. And I would love to see a lot more of those all over. Um, like on the nature walks and the beaches and all over town, um, really for all ages, even seniors. Um, and um, I, of course, being from New Orleans, initially thought we definitely need to have a cocktail hour at the library after COVID's over. <laughs> but, you know, every chapter of my mystery novel starts with a cocktail recipe, so, you know. Um, so anyway, so I have, 
I love coming up with ideas. I don't have to be on the trustee. I would love to just work with the library in any capacity, um, just like creating ways for the library to engage with uh, the community. I did just work a couple of days because the public schools were super desperate for help as they were reopening. Um, and, um, and I don't know which library that we're trying to connect with between Manchester and the town, if it's the elementary school or the high school, but um, I, um, I, I love forging connections. I love interacting with people. And I just like a lot of fun and colorful things. I've been to some great events at the Manchester library. I think they could definitely kick it up a notch, but um, you know, this is somebody who, I like really theatrical book readings. I don't like just sitting there reading a book. I mean, I love to sit and read a book. I just want to watch someone else do it. But anyway, so I um, I have degrees in creative writing from UCLA English education from, I have a master's in education from Harvard. I have the novel certification at Stanford. I just did a reading with them with my last mystery novel, 400 people on Friday. And um, so I think COVID obviously has lots of huge drawbacks, but I also think there's real gifts in it and um, and a lot of positive things I see coming out of it after being at the school and and um, just seeing the indomitable spirit and resilience of all the children there. Um, however, I have to say that I'm extremely impressed with David and Kate. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you guys have done a lot and um, and our our you know, doing incredible work. I've never worked in municipal anything. So um, I actually was not expecting a 50 page book of bylaws that was sent to me. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, I thought this was just like, go library. How can we make the library more awesome? So uh, anyway, that's it. <laughs> okay, so, um... <clears throat> Uh, again, I'll go through in, in order here. So Becky Jakes. Hi, Marcy. I love the enthusiasm. Thank you very much. Um, and just an aside, I was born in Louisiana. So there you go. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Um, now you have children, I believe. I do, I right? do, I do. Yes. Yeah. So um, in terms of time commitment, and now that you've seen the bylaws, et cetera. <laughs> so, you might want the friends, but anyway, do you have any, any significant restrictions on your time? I know most of us are how much of it, but um, would it be problematic time-wise for you to do both the trustee and the financial aspect? And I don't know what those time commitments are. I'm just going to say, I don't know what the time commitments are. I'd have to say um, that I don't see any problems. I mean, my my job is writer, so I am helping out with whatever schools. And so I can kind of make my own schedule. I do have two kids. They are 16. She's in 11th grade um, at Pingree. And my son is in eighth grade at Brooklyn. So, um, you know, obviously, they're, they still require some attention, but... <laughs> They're, they're kind of self-sufficient at this point. Yes. Um, so, but at that I said, I mean, they do just have me as a single mom. So um, it, I'm, I'm sure you guys all have busy other things you're doing as well. So if you can fit it in, I can. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to have you in town. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you, Eli, and uh, great to meet you, Marcy. And I'm, I'm really excited about you know the, the the dynamism and the enthusiasm that you bring to the whole picture here, and especially the fact you've only been in town a year. You've been in the area for a while, but in town a year, and you're already raising your hand, and that uh, that says a lot. You want to get you want to get involved. You certainly come across as a you know a creative content type. Um, coming up with ideas, how can we do this? And there aren't any walls. It's pretty much a blank piece of paper. You, you, you want to do things that you think are, are different and new. And so I just ask, so you, you've spent some time in the library and in libraries in general, um, what kinds of programs in your free thinking spirit would you say, this is what 
Manchester needs? Oh, God, so many. <laughs> I was like, Top you know, because <laughs> during COVID, yeah. Okay, so I was just thinking for COVID, it would be so great to have like a library light show outside of the library or using some sort of um, lights and shadow puppets where children could come see the puppet show, but be in a distance. Um, I always want to see dancing while reading poetry. I really think poetry is underutilized in our in our world. So I'm always trying to incorporate it into everything. Um, that's the, once COVID's over or even figuring out a way to do it online, festivals of books, stories, and ideas where we're bringing children's literature to life. So um, costumes and, you know, when I teach Harry Potter, we do wand making, we do spell book making, we, we learn all the Latin words for the spells and we make owls and we, you know, it's just, it's so, and, and that was another thing I thought of is doing book boxes where um, we recommend reading to, um, to parents and then give out book boxes if they wanted to swing by and come get them where they would have a craft. They could go find a stick in the woods with their child, have some glitter and feathers to put on it or, or whatever the craft might be, mandrake roots, potions, recipes. Um, I thought that would be super amazing to do with seniors as well and, or, and really every age group. I would love that personally. Um, I love everything the library does to engage with the community. Oh, and so one thing that I love and I thought other people would love is hearing fun facts about authors, um, like things that we've heard about Poe, what's really true, or Robert Louis Stevenson, you know, how he wrote Treasure Island when he had tuberculosis. But those kinds of things I love to hear about. But then also there's a professor creating video games based on Treasure Island. That is freaking awesome. Like, I would love to hear that. I would love to, you know, have those kinds of things go out into the community for people um, along with cocktail recipes. <laughs> Why am I always getting back to cocktail recipes? I don't know. Um, of like, here, make this cocktail, read your book, sit by your fireplace, or we're going to have a book club. And um, when I do book club, I like to always incorporate um, feathers, sequins, glitter, costuming. So we just, you know, how fun would that be to pick up a box and have a book club with, you know, boas and crowns well maybe not for you but <laughs> for <women. laughs> anyway those are some of my ideas of like oh and the other thing I thought it was like a an ice cream truck type tricycle how great would it be to be like on the beach or to see the ice cream truck coming but it's got books instead of ice cream and kids could it could be I mean so many books get donated um it could be books being given out for free, um, books being loaned, um, anything like that. So anyway, those are my ideas. It's a long list, more than three for sure. I hope the library folks were keeping track. Cut me off. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Harrison. Wow, a kind of overwhelming enthusiasm, enthusiasm and a font of ideas. <laughs> um, I really, you, you have explained your position so well. I really can't ask you anything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bob Turner. Marcy, you're batting clean up here and it's, uh, it's really hard to go when uh, a lot of questions have been asked for, um, the other two candidates, and I'm I'm pretty much um, in that same position. John's question was the one that I was most interested in, and you've answered that uh, in spades. So thank you, thank you for your, your throwing a hat in your ring, and and uh, and I'm without another question from what we've said so far. So thank you. Okay, so I don't uh, have any other questions either, but I do have an observation or two. Um, uh, you're, you're obviously enormous, enormously creative. Um, you, you said earlier that you were impressed uh, by um, how much uh, other folks have done. And it's true that uh, you find that's one thing that I found very interesting as I go through volunteering here. A lot of people interested in, in the town here have amazing breadth of coverage of different 
um, uh, skills, interests, um, and it's a part of what makes working for this town um, interesting. Um, and I'll make the observation that uh, you appear to have covered quite a lot of territory yourself, um, given the, the fire hose of things you just gave us, the teaching at Brookwood, the involvement with PBD Essex, um, uh, your work as an artist, a mystery writer. Um, so uh, certainly wouldn't be selling yourself short there. You um, have a fairly impressive list of things that you've done and bases you've covered. Uh, members of the library trustees, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, hi, Eli, it's Rick. Um, so I actually just wanted to ask kind of quickly, um, obviously, David understands the relationship of the friends between the position of a li library board of trustees. Um, so Marcy and Kate, do you have any kind of questions concerning the difference between the Friends of the Library, which is an independent organization, versus the Board of Trustees, which is a civic. I'm Marcy, happy to describe it, but I just want to make sure you understood the difference. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand that, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked on boards before. I don't know if Board of Trustees is a different thing than being on a board, but, you know, we basically were trying to usher in you know, just trying to make the organization the best it could be, plan for the future, um, handle any challenges that were happening. So I'm assuming it's that kind of a thing. Um, and Friends of the Library is probably uh, more ways of supporting the library and making it, you know, coming up with ideas to make it more interactive and more engaging with the community, as opposed to, um, you know, making the decisions behind the scenes. Is, is that right? I don't know. Um, Marcy, I was just going to step in and and like you uh, issue my understanding. The board, the trustees are more about the governance uh, and the responsibilities in support of the strategic direction for the library. And um, I am clear on the difference with the friends. One of the questions that I had as I was listening to David would your intention be to have both the friends position and the trustee position, or would you relinquish the friends position if you were to get the trustee position? Actually, I wanna step in here. So David already said that he would be relinquishing, relinquishing the um, position. And the reason is, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that there's a firewall between the friends of the yep. library and the trustees position. The reason for that is that the, one of the, the main uh, things the friends does, they do uh, fundraising for the library. Yes. And uh, trustees of the library and town employees are not um, uh, allowed to do any fundraising for the library. There has to be a firewall between those two agencies. They have a number of different committees in town, such as the Council on Aging, um, uh, that receive uh, donations and support, financial support outside of the normal um, funding of the town. And uh, there's a friends committee that goes alongside of them. And there is a firewall between the um, town committees and the um, friends committees, which do fundraising and provide uh, resources to the uh, town. Eli, I believe that library trustees do raise money. The staff cannot, but the trustees are fundraisers. They can be, uh, yeah. And not, not for the foundation. That's why the foundation is separate. And that has a different board. Uh, in addition to two library trustees, there's other board members there. But when we did the expansion to the children's room, the trustees raised money. Uh, every five years, we do a small building fund fundraiser to help pay for things that are not in the budget or that the friends don't uh, uh, support. So it is one of the jobs of the trustees especially if there's a building project. Um, my error, um, uh, yes, for the uh, 501. Maybe Greg is better at this than I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll step in. Hi, it's Rick again. Um, so Marcy, David, Kate, you guys, uh, you explained it all very well among yourselves, right? So the, the, to Eli's point, there is a firewall between the friends and the trustees. The trustees are a board elected um, civic 
right, officership from the town, right? Versus the Friends are an independent organization. We work in concert very much, um, but the Friends have a lot more sort of liberty in what they can do in terms of um, choosing activities and things that they want to support versus the trustees are managing the um, budget for the library for the town. So th there's a little bit of a separation there. They do, the trustees do have an opportunity to raise money again independently uh, via communication, right? And that money goes to the town and goes to the library. Um, so anyway, I, we won't believe the, believe the point. I just wanted to make sure you understood that there was a separation between those two departments. Um, I think I want to thank everybody, you guys, for raising your hands. Uh, as John said, um, I think it speaks really well of this town that there's so much interest and activity around the library. Um, I guess one quick question, I don't even know what the question, but I would assume um, whoever doesn't get selected out of the three of you, uh, honestly, your skills uh, in are so great, right? And your interest is so high. Um, would love to be able to tap into your skill sets to be able to have you participate in supporting the library as we move forward, right? You don't necessarily have to be a trustee to be able to support the library and would love to have you guys contribute moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. So uh, the um, board of selectmen and the um, library trustees will meet uh, in two weeks to vote on uh, the new trustee. And uh, uh, thank everybody for coming in tonight and uh, we'll, um, what the outcome is. Uh, so um, before I move on to the next agenda item, I wanna make uh, one quick comment uh, regarding the chat. We had a, an interloper here a little bit earlier who used the name of a town employee when making a comment to that person's name remove those entries have been removed from the list of people attending the meeting. Um, <clears throat> the comment was not from a town employee. All right, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is uh, Forrest. Oh, um, I, I thanked all the candidates for coming. I want to thank the board, uh, library board of trustees for coming in as well tonight. Um, all right, so moving on to agenda item number three, which is a consideration of a stop sign at the intersection of Forest Street and Ancient County Way. Uh, Greg, do you want to speak to this? Thanks, Eli. Uh, very quickly and simply, uh, both uh, Chuck Dam and DPW and, and Todd Fitzgerald, police chief, uh, both recommend to you that we formally make uh, that intersection a three-way stop Currently, it is a two-way stop. Um, the uh, approach on Forest uh, uh, coming off of 127 to that intersection right now currently is not uh, required to stop. Um, it, the opinion of both the chief and DPW director are that it would improve the safety of that intersection and also slow cars down along Forest and in Aitchin County Way if folks have to stop um, in all three directions at that intersection. So the recommendation is for you to approve uh, making that a three-way stop. All right, so some aspects of this have been discussed at previous meetings. Uh, I'm gonna go around the board members uh, first to see if they have any questions or comments. Becky. Uh, no further questions or comments. John Ram. No, I'm good, Eli. I think we've covered this a couple of times. Yeah. Ann Harrison. No questions. Mr. Bob Turner. Just a comment. The sign's already in place. Coming up from coming up from uh, 127 up Forest, there is a sign on a telephone pole that's octagonal red and says stop on it. So it's <laughs> all it's already there. Um, and uh, we, they, they, we appreciate the, the efficiency of the DPW in um, what is probably a foreground conclusion because we discussed this last time. 
they 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 thought that it was approved at your last meeting and they got a little ahead of the curve but we uh we understand we need to get your formal vote tonight mm. this is what happens when you have selectmen who ride their bicycle all around town so <laughs> Well done, time. Jeff. Did you stop at the stop sign, Jeff? I always stop for stop signs. All right. So, members of the public, any uh, questions or comments about this? I'll take that as a no. So, all right. I'll take a motion to approve the stop sign at the intersection of Forest Street and Ancient County Way. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. So, all right, so I'm gonna say Becky and Ann Harrison. Um, <clears throat> any discussion? All in favor? Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Round? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Bob Turner? Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right, let's move on to item number four, which is a 40B update. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for this part of the discussion, I said at the meeting on Thursday that we were going to be discussing um, scheduling of next steps and um, seeing if we wanted to make any decisions about um, uh, what sorts of questions we be posing to other boards at this point. Um, we don't necessarily have to have a specific list of things that we want to parcel out to other boards right now, but I wanted to, to leave that open for board members to um, comment on. Uh, but more importantly, I, I did want to talk about the schedule of what we're going to do over um, uh, when we're going to have our next uh, workshop meetings how often we're going to have workshop meetings and, and, and to do this in the context or in light of um, how the conversation went at our last workshop meeting um, and uh, the pace that we wanna move this process forward in. So we, we have to um, balance uh, uh, need to respond to the developer in a reasonably timely fashion uh, because otherwise the developer can uh, get frustrated with us and potentially turn this into a non-friendly 40B um, <clears throat> with the need for the board to be able to exercise an appropriate um, uh, due diligence in, in building its list of conditions. Um, <clears throat> Originally, when I um, set up, uh, after we got the first presentation and I set up the first work and we set up the first workshop meeting, I was thinking that we would be considering having meeting with the developer in November and then another meeting in December. Um, there are probably going to be at least two meetings with the developer while we work through these conditions, um, assuming that we're going to get to a letter of endorsement. Um, <clears throat> But I think that uh, uh, my original estimates were overly optimistic, um, just because there's a lot of ground for us to cover. And so I want to get have a little bit of discussion with the board about um, the time frame of when we uh, think we want to engage the developer again in a meeting with the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, assuming that the board feels the same as I do, that it's unlikely that we're going to get to a meeting in December. Um, we might want to consider uh, making some communication to the developer to give them an, an idea of where we're going. So rather than leave them in the dark, um, give them uh, a heads up of what our, where we think our process is and um, uh, what steps we need to take before we uh, would engage them again. So that's, that's me teeing up this part of the discussion. Uh, and why don't we take that topic first, this, this pace at which we want to engage the developer. Um, and I'll go, uh, how about with Ms. Jakes first? Um, I guess the, the 
speed with which we move, I think it's should be dictated by how comfortable we are with um, information we're getting. Uh, we have John Witten, um, who is a font of knowledge, both of our own bylaws um, and 40Bs. Um, I'm, it's been posed to me that perhaps we um, well, let me back that up. We have we have Sue Brown as town planner. Um, and I don't know if Sue's been involved in a 40B before. Um, but are we confident that we have the expertise to um, ask the right questions in advance? Um, without having um, maybe a um, a consultant. Um, so uh, are you, uh, I want to clarify who you're asking there. Are you asking me or are you asking Sue? Are you asking... I guess I'm asking all of us is, is, um, and, and it would have to, I would have to ask Sue and Greg as well, if they're, if they're comfortable with their knowledge base of, of 40 B's and the types of questions we need to be asking and, um, and our ability to anticipate potentially what the developer um, is really hoping to get. Well, so when we next meet with a developer, um, it's my uh, belief and understanding that what we're gonna be starting to talk about is the, the conditions. Um, right. uh, I don't think it's so much of a question and answer period with the developer, although there will be some. I think the idea is to go in with some framework um, around the conditions that we would uh, want to have in order to consider and uh, giving them a letter of endorsement. I think so, I didn't make myself clear. I, 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 I'm, I, and I apologize for that, Eli. Um, I don't, I just, I'm concerned that we, we while we don't want this not to stay a friendly 40B, I also am concerned that it, it move at a pace where we can answer the types of questions um, we need to answer. And do, I guess, the, what my actual question is, do we need a consultant or do we have people um, who can advise us uh, with experience, such as Greg and Sue and John, or do we need a consultant who's been through this before? Okay, so John Witten has obviously been through a bunch of 40Bs and we're expecting to rely on him for expertise around the, the process of... Um, <clears throat> um, um, Absolutely, yes. Uh, around the 40B, the process and the law of it, and what the developer and what classically developers uh, can and, and will withstand in terms of mm -hmm. interacting with the board. Um, um, Sue Brown, do you want to speak to me? Um, I would say that you have the people that you need to know that you're asking the right questions. I think if you have another consultant come in, they are going to simply look to you to define those questions. So our questions in part are being defined by the citizens who have concerns and are sharing those concerns and ideas with us. Um, but I think that um, between Jonathan and myself and um, the Board of Selectmen that we can certainly 
know what questions to ask or know what we might want to negotiate. Well, and to that end, Sue, what I'm getting at, is, I mean, have, have you gone through 40B negotiations before? Has Greg gone through them before? For us to be able to properly anticipate, um, you know, it, any of us who goes through an experience, we always know what to ask after the fact. <laughs> so having somebody who knows who's been through it, um, and I know John has, um, but I'm just trying to make sure that we have all the anticipated question answerers we need. Does that make sense? I think to answer a lot of the questions that you may have, we will need additional expertise. So okay, I, thank I, so I think, you. I think we will do quite well in asking the questions from yeah. the from the residents in terms of all the letters and, and good questions people are asking to your own questions, to John, John's, Jonathan's experience in asking questions, Sue's experience asking questions. So I feel confident that the questions will be asked. I think we will need, definitely will need some additional assistance in answering the questions to our satisfaction. So that means getting some additional consultants on board, um, uh, you know, Last, at your last Thursday's meeting, specifically, um, you know, traffic and overall mm -hmm. traffic management in and around town um, was, a, was a broad topic of concern and we, would, we could use some assistance with that. Um, the, the fiscal impacts and, and reviewing their analysis and, and doing some uh, fact checking and, and assumptions that, uh, that the developers yep. making will want to help have some assistance um, in that arena. Um, and then you talked about, you know, the whole geology and blasting expertise. Um, and there are probably others, you know, hydrology, so that is something that is, is very well handled at the state level. We, we probably don't need to delve in quite as much into that because I think that'll be well handled. Um, you know, architectural design and aesthetics and, and visual impacts, you may want some assistance with that. So I think there, there are a number of disciplines where we will want to have some assistance um, in, in, as we go forward. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Sue. And Eli, um, the shorter answer to your question is, I agree regarding December. All right, um, John Rao. Yeah, Eli. So I, it, it seems to me that we, we need to get some of these consultants that we want um, start to move on them right away because they have to answer questions, at least to the application as it stands. I do think that we need to keep the applicant informed about where we are at this point. And I know that Greg is going to put together a list of kind of a summary of this is kind of where we are. And we need to massage that a little bit and then, you know, maybe get that in front of the in, in, in front of the applicant and say, this is where we are. There are other things that we are looking at and, and we need consultants. And I think we probably need to go to, the, go to the applicant right away and say, we're interested in consultant A, B, C, and D. And I'm not sure who they are, but I, I know that Greg, you've got probably a list in your mind. We all do of three or four different people. And are they willing to pay for those consultants to uh, look at this project in our behalf? Um, and maybe that's the first thing that we have to do to see if they're willing to do that and, and start to push things along and, and compile this list. Another thing that came to mind to me is we should speak to a couple of town managers who are in towns where uh, SLC has built projects. And these would be projects that might've been done two, three, you know, a project in process or a project that are done. And as part of their application, they uh, provided us a list of uh, what? One, two, three, five references, uh, four references. One in Newton, one in Needham, Winchester, and two in Winchester. And I'd be kind of curious as to how those town managers say the, the one in Newton was finished in February, 2018. So they've got a couple of years of experience in terms of leasing and how are things going? And is this, and it was, it was an LIP, it was a LIP. And so was the Needham one, that was a LIP. Find out what's going on. And I don't know, I think maybe they're expecting us to do that. I don't know if they're expecting us to speak with the town manager. I think that's the guy we'd want to speak with. 
um, because he's he's the one that is would be probably most objective. Um, so I think that we ought to probably put that line that up. There's something to do. I'm not sure when the right time to do it is, but. Yeah, no, I've, I've started to do that, John. So I, will, I will continue to do so, but I, I've started to make some contacts. Okay, that's good. So, so because I'm curious as to how things have uh, have have worked out, but I, I do think that uh, yeah, we do need to get some consultants pretty soon, and we have to find out where the applicant stands on providing uh, support for them. Well, to that particular point. Um, <clears throat> Should uh, or would it be appropriate for us to uh, assign a board member to uh, talk to some of the um, <clears throat> boards of selectmen of those towns as well to see how they went through the process? I would be happy to do that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Pretty critical. You would be and happy. I think You'd be happy, Eli, to assign someone, or you're saying that you're <laughs> going to do that? I said I would be happy to do that um, in the uh, collegial and professional sense of the word. Um, I, I'm concerned that that adds another hat for you that yes, yeah. in the midst of all the other hats that you're already wearing in this. Um, and uh, I'd be willing to... Uh, to reach out to those boards of selectmen and, uh, in coordination with Greg. And, and I would as well. I certainly won't complain. <clears throat> and thank you. Um, but th this brings me to a, an issue in terms of consultants and and uh, consultations with other towns that have worked with um, this developer previously. Um, and that is this, how uh, the specificity of the questions and specific questions that we want to have addressed. Um, one thing that's often uh, challenging is that when you go to uh, a consultant, um, they're saying, okay, what do you want to know? And how specifically are we defining what we want to know? Um, we don't want them to, to ramble through a lot of stuff that's unnecessary, but we want to make sure that when they come back and report that they have covered the basis that we want them to cover. Um, same holds true for, um, uh, I'll say John and, and, and I, in terms of uh, consulting with uh, boards of selectmen in other towns and Greg's consulting with the town managers. So um, I, I'd like to, to hone in tonight at least a little bit on um, specific questions rather than broad, yeah, we wanna know about pedestrian walkways. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Fair enough. Uh, so, um, and I don't want to, and I don't want to steer us off the path that you're trying to take us on. Right no, no, now. that's okay. Um, uh, uh, let's uh, put that on the uh, put your item on hold briefly, uh, and then I'm going to ask Ann Harrison for her comments on um, the pace with engagement of the developer, and then uh, we may do a little bit of revisiting of this topic. I'm very pessimistic about when we can talk to the developer because I don't have the information I know I need to make a list of what conditions I want to support. Um, and I am quite sure that I have some conditions that other people on the board probably would disagree with. Um, and I, until we know the basics of the information, and I think we've got a pretty good idea where the basics come from. It's the financials, specifically the school, um, and the uh, traffic, um, and uh, something we haven't really talked about. We talked about the workshop slightly. Um, are we going to cut off 
uh, our nose to spite our face by saying, no, we want it much smaller and then not have it reach um, the level that we need uh, to meet the state's 10% affordable. Um, mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of stuff that needs to be discussed at length. And I think we, I would like to see us do a workshop at least every other week and probably every week until we've we've hashed through this. But first, I think we need to get some more confidence in the number, the financial numbers and the traffic numbers. So I wouldn't expect to have anything that we could talk to the developer about, except, you know, this is the process we're going through um, until late January. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, and then uh, one thing I guess we should ch check into is the degree to which we can address the developer in increments. I'm not sure we, because um, uh, one model that uh, um, one model of engaging with them is we uh, have some conditions that we've sorted through um, in particular areas that we know that we want, and we could potentially meet with the developer and say, here's there's a list of areas that we are still in, uh, working on. For example, let's say just traffic. Um, but there are some other areas where we have uh, developed a list of conditions that we expect to be putting into the um, endorsement if we can agree on them. And uh, we could meet and talk about those. So would board members um, uh, think it would be reasonable to do that in steps incrementally? Or would the preference of the board be to build um, out to some degree our entire uh, list of conditions before meeting with the developer at all. I'm for incremental steps. John? Why don't we ask the developer? I mean, we don't know how what his working habits are or, or you know, how, how, how he has worked with other with with, with other towns. Um, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with either way, but I think the incremental thing, everybody kind of knows this is how, how things are, are, are going along, and I would be in favor of that, but uh, maybe the developer has got so much on his plate, hey, hey come back when you think you pretty much are 80% there or something. I, I, I just don't know. It doesn't hurt to ask, does it? Well, I don't know. Um, to be honest, uh, I would rather... Um, as much as possible, tell the developer what we're going to do, um, <clears throat> rather than, because uh, I feel like if we, you know, ask them, hey, what do you want to do? They're going to say, well, this is what I want to do. And, and, right. and if we don't do it, then they say, well, why did you ask? Yeah. Uh, so I'd, I'd sort of rather just um, come up with a reasoned, rational approach and hand it to them. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, so many of the issues are interrelated. Um, it's I would find it hard to come up with an incremental uh, list because we might find that something that we were we have put off would have affected what we asked for initially. Sue and Greg, you got any opinions on that? Well, I, yeah, I, I think to begin with, I think we start with getting the consultants lined up in, in, our, in our further analysis underway. Uh, to me, that's step one. Um, and so that takes a conversation with, with the developer. I don't think that needs to be um, all of you, you could you could authorize me to do that on your behalf, or one of you could join me in that conversation with the developer to say, look, we we need to get some additional information, and we need to do some peer reviews of what you provided, um, and we can have John Jonathan guide us on, on how best to ask that. Um, I, I also would turn to, to Jonathan to get his advice in terms of how that negotiation might transpire. I, I think to some degree. 
you know, it's, it's always incremental and it's never done until the package is, is signed and sealed. Um, you know, so everything's tentatively agreed to until you have the full package. You know, it's going to be you know, similar to how we do union contracts. You know, you, you, you tentatively agree to certain things, but it's, it's not a done deal until you've got the whole package completed. I think the earlier we can address how large the project is, the, I think that'll drive a lot of the other issues. So if we can focus on size earlier rather than later, I think that would be beneficial. So I would start off with getting the consultants underway, getting some dollars from the developer to support that um, and setting up a, a meeting relatively soon on, on the question of total size, number of units. I, I would also, um, this is Sue, Eli. I would also say that um, I think it's important to identify those elements that we are looking for agreement on that aren't a cost to the developer and kind of put those in a bucket by themselves. Those are just kind of, um, not so much negotiations as things that we can agree on that really aren't going to either cost or hurt or harm or um, otherwise affect the, the project, but just some things that we can agree um, to agree on. I mean, I, and I don't think we use those as negotiations because you don't want to be seen offering a whole list of things that they've already given up <laughs> or make the list seem ex exceptionally long. So I think it's kind of two parts. You kind of have some things that you actually negotiate on that may affect the um, project. And then those things that are, you can just agree to agree on, if you know what I'm saying. Does that make sense? So what are some of those items that you, for example? Um, so for example, I think there are um, elements of um, connectivity to um, the open space and the design to, so the design to create connectivity. I think um, the, um, some of the green building elements are natural um, extensions of what a good developer would do. They're not on paper yet, but I think we would agree that that's, that's probably um, not something you really negotiate with. It's in both parties' best interest. I think things like that, and maybe even up to the, maybe even up to the level of a CR. So I think there are some things that, that both would consider to be um, beneficial to both the project in the town and that we might not want to consider them as negotiations. It's, it's a bit in how you, how you're presenting it, um, important to us, but not, not something that they're giving up in order to please us <laughs> or to seek an endorsement. More about approach than anything. Thank you. I worry that they, if we ask them for a series of little things and they agree, then they will say when we come to the stuff that's important, oh, but we've already given you so much. So, you know, we're not, we're, we're the good guys here. You're just being pecky, no, picky and, and we won't negotiate anymore. So that's my concern with starting with the easy stuff. Yeah, and I didn't necessarily say you should start it. I just thought we should separate, I think you should separate them out and not consider them negotiations in that you don't want to, them to affect the other. I agree with you, Anne. You don't want them to affect the what you really want to negotiate. Jeff? Um, I think we're getting down into the fine points of strategy. And I'd like to back up a little bit and say um, that uh, Greg's comment about we need to get our consultants in line and 
my previous comment about we need to have our questions for our consultants um, set up very specifically as soon as possible um, so that um, we're not going back to the consultants and saying, yeah, but what about this? Um, so that we have our broad buckets of, um, you know, building design, uh, uh, community impact, fiscal impact, um, environmental impact, um, that we have all those lined up and we have our consultants lined up to address the questions that we have for them. Um, we really need to get going on that before we can, uh, you know, address the pace of re-engaging with the uh, with the uh, developer himself. So, um, and and some of that may come from consulting with our own town board, um, with the exception, of course, of CBA. But um, okay. so. Um, uh, point taken. So let me rephrase the and engaging the pace or discussing the pace of the engagement with the developer a little bit. The very least we have to, um, uh, so if we want to engage, engage, engage consultants, there's been discussions about going back to the developer and saying, hey, we need to, um, we've de developed this list of uh, major list of concerns and we've developed a list of consultants that we wish to engage and we want you to pay for some of it now rather than later. So we, we will have to engage them um, at some point and we have to, as a board, define when that's going to be and how that's going to be. So that, that's not necessarily pace, but at least it's, we're going to have to pick that first point of engagement. It does sound like we want to do that fairly soon. Um, uh, and I guess I'll leave that um, alone for now. So let, maybe maybe we should go back to the issue of consultants and talk about those a little bit now. Um, we're still at a pretty high level with respect to which consultants we want. Um, uh, Greg came up with a, a short list uh, already. Greg, do you want to go through that? The, the, the topic areas you mean for yeah. the consultants? Um, oh yeah, that, that short list based on your discussion on Thursday was um, again the, the fiscal fiscal impacts, the uh, the whole area of traffic management, um, and and the whole area of um, environmental impacts with a focus that you had the other night on on the whole blasting issue and the geology. Um, there are firms out there that can. That could be a one-stop shop for lots of this. Um, you know, there are you know, engineering firms that, that, that can handle quite a bit of this. Um, depends on how you want to approach it. We can, or, or if you prefer to have, you know, individual uh, special, specialists um, who, who, who aren't necessarily working in, in one firm. Um, Again, we can consult with Jonathan in terms of some of his experiences with some of the consultants that are out there mm -hmm. to get some ideas from him as well. Um, but I think if you know if we spent a little bit of time, uh, it doesn't have to be tonight, but perhaps all of you you know start jotting down your specific questions by the by the topic area, and you know we could we can have another session next week and, and hone in on what questions you want to be asking the consultants. And by then we could bring to you um, some consultants that, that we feel might be helpful. Um, and we, we could ask Jonathan just to reach out to developer and say, we'd like to move forward with, with getting some of these answers, these questions answered through, through the consultants and, and ask for X amount of dollars to support that. Okay. Um, so, uh, the other thing that factors into the consultants potentially, um, uh, when you say uh, whether or not the board wants to go with uh, a one shot, uh, one sh one shot for all of them, or 
individual consultants um, and getting information from John Witten about what he might recommend. There's also the issue of what the other town managers who've already dealt with the 40B on the lift that dealing with SLC um, yeah. or SLV um, have done, what consultants they've used. So maybe part of what goes into that list of which consultants we want uh, uh, comes from uh, the town managers uh, and the board of selectmen uh, in those towns um, who actually experience particular consultants dealing okay. with uh, SLV. Um, but that's picking the particular consultants, not necessarily picking the areas. Um, <clears throat> So how about um, we go back to the item that Anne mentioned, which is uh, the need for having workshop groups more frequently, um, potentially every um, week for the next little while. Um, uh, that's not necessarily a bad idea, um, given how much ground we need to cover. Um, Do people feel like adding a well, meeting every week on Thursday to hopefully be somewhat shorter? We're not going to be looking at three hour working groups. Some of these we would take public input and some we wouldn't. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but we could uh, uh, essentially set up goals for the next week for what we were going to accomplish and then um, review them at the next meeting. So for example, for the, if we decided to have a meeting Thursday after this one, um, it could be around uh, developing a list of consultants and um, um, also discussing uh, specific areas or specific instructions to the consultants that uh, board members might wish to pose. Um, Is that an approach that people want to take? Um, the Thursday after next is Thanksgiving. Oh, and although yeah. it's going to be small, I was kind of hoping to have a glass or two of wine at <laughs> dinner. <laughs> yeah. That's not compatible with a board meeting. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but can we... next week, you could try to meet Monday or Tuesday if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then, and then go to, back to Thursdays after. Yeah, Tuesday would be doable. Tuesday be, um, you know, far enough out and far enough away from Thanksgiving for people. I could do it. Works and for me. Tom meeting that night, but. And the purpose of that workshop is to do what? Well, the purpose of that workshop would be to um, uh, have a more detailed list of potential consultants um, and discuss them. And then also to discuss um, specific, um, uh, specific requests that we would want to make of those consultants. So constraining their efforts. So then we would do two things in that meeting, essentially. We would try to... Um, narrow down the, the actual consultants that we would like to use. And that would require that in the meantime, we <clears throat> gather input from John Witten um, and from uh, other town managers and boards uh, as to which consultants they've used when dealing with SLV. Um, <clears throat> and probably uh, focus that on the general areas that we've already identified that we want consultants in. And then I would anticipate that a little bit more of the discussion that we have tonight would be around what what those general areas are, and do we need to do we believe that we need to add to them? Do you want to put that? off a little bit and then we're talking no. about the general areas of consultants. I don't think so. No, we need to firm we need to firm up a date 
Um, the 24th, there's a conservation commission meeting. Um, there's nothing on the 23rd. Planning board meeting on the 23rd. Okay, that's not posted yet. All right. Well, I could do uh, the, I think we could do the 24th, couldn't we? Yeah, there's no reason we can't. I mean, okay, so. It's not uh, necessary for the Conservation Commission to be there or vice versa, right? Right. What about the input from our boards? I mean, we've asked for input. We've gotten some input. Are we done with that? Or do we have? Certainly not. No. Clearly, Finance Committee has barely had a chance to dig into the uh, numbers and impact to, to any degree, but they were not, they're not going to come up with the, the, uh, their answers in a week or two weeks. That's going to be a gradual process. Um, we uh, certainly need to, um, if, we, if we want to engage consultants and keep the pace of this moving, we need to, um, if that's our first, one of our first steps, then uh, we need to do that fairly rapidly. Or at least we need to get yeah deeper into the process. As, as maybe this, we don't have the full list of questions that we want to ask of the consultants. Maybe we don't um, have that fully resolved in a week, but right. we should get started. Well, Eli, you raise, you raise a question about, you know, FinCom and, uh, you know, we have planning board, CONCOM. Um, we've asked them for input. Um, what information do they need to provide us with input? Um, because that can go to our consultants as part of the package of, these are the questions that we want our consultants to answer. And we need to get that fairly rapidly. That's true. So maybe that's actually our first charge to um, other boards is to um, give us input on that that particular topic. What what they might need from consultants. Is that that that's what you're saying, right? Right, because we're the ones that are going to engage these consultants, um, and uh, to do that, we want their input in terms of what kinds of information, what kinds of questions do they need to have answered as specifically as possible. As the uh, school committee and, and, to have that, this, and to have that information by the twenty fourth. Yeah. Has the school committee been brought into this at this point? Uh, we've not engaged the school committee directly yet. No. Okay. It seems to me we would probably want some thoughts about thoughts from them. That's not that's not consultant dependent though. I believe or, that the developer has met with the school committee briefly. Okay. I'm just. Curious what the school committee's thoughts were about their estimates and how that might affect their budget one way or the other. Yeah. Well, that's that's another, I think, consultant or or um, impact study we need. Eli. Um, yes. This is Sarah Mellish, FinCom. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. We we've, we've met on this we've discussed it it's not totally clear to us what we need to give you and we don't expect to have another meeting discussing it until january january we we have a budget meeting on 12 5 12 7 and we don't have another meeting to discuss it until january so that time frame is going to have to change Okay, let us know. <clears throat> so, um, we're challenged with the lack of information. What information do you need? We 
need to better understand what the developer is proposing and what the financial implications are? Well, this actually goes back to the size issue that Greg is pointing out. So, um, developer is given a pretty good, clear idea of what he's actually um, proposing, which is 157 units with a particular profile. And you guys have that full package. Yes. Um, uh, the town is going to probably go back and uh, ask for an alternative not, um, uh, sizing of that project. Um, <clears throat> at one point we talked about, you know, 120 units as being um, one of the um, uh, boundaries that we might be interested in. But I think the idea would be that uh, <clears throat> we would like to get um, validation of some of the financial impacts that the developer, um, so the developer gave us some numbers, which uh, they think would be the financial impacts, both in plot positives and minuses with respect to taxes and expenses. Um, and it uh, mostly revolves around the size of the project. And I guess the question that I would ask of FinCom is, what else do you need to know besides the size of the project in order to um, validate some of those financials? And the financial impact, and um, if it, if you need more information, um, where do you think you need it from? I guess the challenge is that my understanding is the Affordable Housing Trust has asked to reduce the affordable from eighty percent to sixty percent, which might have significant financial impacts on the project, and that yep. could impact what the finance committee could ask for other items such as fire, et cetera. Um, if I may suggest, we've really considered a number um, asking for a reduction to about 120 units. So I think it's important to go through the financial impact of both the 157 unit plan and a 110, 120 unit plan and see what the differences are. And as far as the AMI is concerned, I, I think some of those things can be um, developed somewhat independently. So for example, um, uh, the impact of the fire department isn't necessarily going to depend on the, the AMI numbers. Um, how the developer might react to a request from us uh, mm -hmm. uh, is one thing, but I don't think uh, I'm necessarily asking FinCom to um, <clears throat> evaluate what we should ask the developer for. Um, I think rather the question is to validate what the actual financial impact of the town is, whether or not, so the developer says, this is how much money it's gonna bring in. Um, this is how much money it's going to cost from an emergency uh, services standpoint. Evaluate those, those um, statements and see whether or not we agree with the developer. Okay, it's, it's my understanding that they change the AMI as a substantial impact on the financial financials. For the developer? Yes. Well, that may be true, um, but that's just a negotiation point, right? Okay. I'm, I'm concerned more about the financial impact of the town. Okay. Um, we'll add it to our December 7th meeting. Eli, may, maybe we need to go to the developer pretty early on here and say, we're thinking about 120. Is this a go, no go? I mean, he hasn't really come back and said, the numbers just don't work for us under really much of any circumstances below a certain level. We don't know what that level is. And as Sarah has just indicated, maybe with the going to the 80 to the 60, um, that's also a, that, that's a no go situation. I mean, we could ask both of those questions, but 
seems to me that the developer really has to put together some numbers with uh, whatever variables we put in there. And right now we've just got the size one. If you introduce the 80 to 60 variable, now you've got a couple of different combinations to look at uh, to see, see what they, they have to say. Have we validated that the 120 meets the 40B total affordable housing 10%? Yeah, Sue commented on that, I think, last week, right, Sue? It just meets it. That's a concern, I yeah. think. Yes. That's before the 2020 census. Yeah, we won't know for sure until that number comes out, but what it's projected to be 120 would kind of guess, just get us there. Okay. And by just getting us there, my my worry is that okay, if we get, you know, four more houses going in, I I, I worry about the if we're going through all these motions and just getting it, how easily do we lose that? I agree. Yep. yep. I think the other thing to consider though is is that if we've learned anything that we need to be on our game about producing on an annual basis, more diverse housing. And, and if we can show progress toward our housing production plan, that is a safe harbor. And I think we, it would behoove us to put a lot more energy into that in the years going forward. But Greg, we haven't done that in the last five years. That's the point. I understand that. And why we're here we that's, are. That's, that's part of <laughs> That's we exactly have, we have, why we're here. Is that's not a pattern. Well, but, <laughs> or it is a pattern, not the pattern we want. Well, but, but the, what has changed in the last five years yeah. is that we have put um, tools into place so that we can make progress, which we did not have prior to five years ago. But we, so we, we did, had a housing production plan five years ago and we didn't meet any of the goals. Yeah, I think, I think we need to learn that lesson well. Right. We do have better in place, you know, is the new master plan. We have, we, we are funding the trust, which was not funded very well five years ago, right. affordable housing trust. Um, we have a, a very interesting study underway in terms of the housing authority properties and how that might um, be renovated and expanded. Um, so I think, I think we do have better better options at our disposal now than we did five years ago. I agree. So Sari, you, uh, you're gonna put this on the um, FinCon's agenda for December 7th. Um, uh, I would give them a heads up like now about what's gonna be on the agenda for December 7th. And I would also, uh, I think that I would give you the heads up that I'm gonna ask, probably end up asking FinCon to meet, um, uh, very possibly asking them to meet more, more regularly um, uh, through December um, to address some, if we have any additional questions on this. Um, going to December and then to January and uh, et cetera, uh, for these discussions is gonna be much too slow. So we have weekly meetings starting January. Um, so you're asking, we meeting on the 7th and you're asking for us to meet, what, another week in December? Yeah, I may very well be asking you to meet another week or two in December. Well, we're pushing, pushing vacations. I'm hoping to go visit my 95 year old mother that I haven't seen in a year in Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, um, I understand that. Uh, so you said December <laughs> is your next meeting? Next meeting is December 7th, which is joint with BOS on the budget. Yes. Yeah. We can meet on the 14th, well, the 16th. December 16th to deal with this issue. Well, I want you to meet before that. When when you want us to meet? Well, at, at 
uh, no later on the seventh uh, on the first set of issues that we've just posed to you. Um, so you want us to meet in November? Yeah, what if you try to meet the first week of December and then the seventh really is dedicated to budget, preliminary budget, and then again on the 14th. So if you met, what is that first Wednesday? Uh, second. The first? I think, yeah. I think it is, but I could be wrong. But that's a ZBA meeting, Sarah. Oh, God. <laughs> You're right. So you want us to meet again, like on the 14th? Potentially. OK. Or 15th, we'll see. What's the is. Just running. Of course, Lickman is going to meet on the 7th, on the 21st in December for regular meetings. And the way we're going right now, we're going to be having um, workshops possibly on the 3rd and the 10th at this rate. What so, about the 30th for FinCom? Maybe I don't really want to necessarily um, try Micro to sort out FinCom yeah. dates right now. I guess I just want to deliver the message um, meet soon and expect more uh, requests from the board. Zoom is good. <laughs> um, so as, as far as the other boards are concerned, um, <clears throat> Can we actually, can we go back and talk about the areas of the potential um, uh, uh, consultants that we talked about? We did talk about fiscal impact. Um, Greg mentioned traffic in management and environmental impact. Um, both traffic management and environmental impact um, are areas that the planning board might want to inject uh, um, discussions into um, the, <clears throat> Um, actually, I'm going to take a, a, a segue for a minute. I got to talk about the chat. Um, uh, and I, uh, I'm sorry, folks, but uh, I'm, I'm starting to develop the opinion that the, the chat for uh, Zoom meetings, for board meetings, needs to go away. Um, and I'm just going to give you a heads up that right now I'm trying to sort out with this board um, some fairly complicated timing issues. So I'll just tell you right now and right up front, I am not going to answer, address, or deal with anything that anybody puts into the chat tonight, just to set expectations. If there are other comments or questions that people want to ask, I'm going to ask for some public input maybe at the end of this, but we're already well past the time allotted to um, this part uh, of the meeting. Uh, and it, it's just gonna get out of control. So um, there's, there's one meeting here, not a meeting and a chat. Um, and I just wanna make that clear. So, um, all right, so back to traffic management and environmental impact and other boards that would be interested in those areas. Um, I think that we might want to get some input from the planning board on both of those. The planning board regularly talks about um, issues related to, or rather the, um, they do reviews of, of projects that cover um, these aspects. So, if there are particular questions that we would like to ask of the um, consultants or constrain them, planning board might want to weigh in on those. And then CONCOM might want to weigh in, in on the environmental impact. Those are the areas that I think um, that we could query boards on. Um, uh, comments from board members? Yeah, quest, question, Eli. So when we look at the consultants, we've got, uh, and, and I see the list of three or four that, that Greg had suggested. Is an environmental consultant separate from this uh, blasting consultant? I mean, it's conceivable that both no. could be the same, same, but it seems to me that they could be different. 
I thought blasting was under the environmental. That was well. It, it says geologist blasting consultant. I'm not sure that that pulls in all of the environmental considerations, or you need someone with a different set of skills skills for the environmental questions, of which we might be asking, which deal more with uh, you know septic and and uh, storm water management and that sort of thing on the water table. Well, the water okay. table is part of the blasting, but. Um, Greg and Sue, do you have any opinions there? Yeah, um, Ile, I would say that while a firm may um, provide all of those within that firm, they would definitely have a specialist um, for blasting. Okay. And there are individual firms that just deal with that. So it's, that's, again, just depends on which way you want to go, whether you want um, to look at a firm that has um, various specialties or if you want to go to a specialist and, and they're both out there. All right, well, let's not drill down too deep there. Let's just gather up <laughs> things and things geological um, into the one bucket for now in terms of who we're gonna, which boards we're gonna ask to weigh in on, um, what questions we wanna pose to a uh, consultant. So if we told, um, for example, the planning board, um, we're planning on engaging a traffic um, uh, management consultant to look at the impact of traffic um, coming out of this development. Uh, and we're also looking at um, going to uh, look uh, uh, an environmental impact consultant who would cover um, impact the environment as well as geological issues including stormwater runoff and blasting, what, what specific questions would the planning board like to have answered um, uh, by that consultant in order to make suggestions to the board uh, about conditions that they would wish to apply to uh, constrain the developer? Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. What about um, our water, water resource? Do we need a study of that done? I mean, in terms of the impact to the uh, water usage? Yes. So I, I don't think we actually need to uh, um, uh, spend dollars on that. Um, uh, uh, I would like, if, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Chuck already has a lot of the numbers. Um, yep. Uh, and and I actually have um, a bunch of numbers. What I'd like is if you'd give me um, a week or so to work with Chuck. <coughs> I think I can give you probably give you an overview that's that's going to be sufficient in that area, um, <clears throat> and would save us from spending more time on that. Excellent. And does he have any? Um suggestions regarding traffic as well check like traffic and travel i'm not sure we've asked them that yet would it would it make sense or not really well it certainly makes sense to, to ask him if he has any engineering questions that we want to ask him or not uh, thank you all right, so we can ask the planning board to give input about what uh, what what uh, input they would like from any consultants in traffic management and the environmental impact areas. I think the constant concom could also be asked about environmental impact. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think concom necessarily needs to weigh in on traffic management. No. Uh, is there any other area that uh, we'd like concom in the near term to weigh in on? Uh, from this, from the standpoint of if we have to, add, if we want to task consultants with with um, information gathering, Concom has its own big slew of things that they're chasing right now. But I don't necessarily want to go down that rabbit hole. Do we? What about? And this might not be a rabbit hole to go down yet. But um, Concom um, and planning board in terms of design. We're not going there yet. Well, actually, we can ask planning board to give input on 
design because one of the topics, one of the conditions that was discussed was the uh, <clears throat> the pen potential visible impact. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we can ask for architectural um, recommendations. So um, I don't think we need to go to uh, outside consultants for that. I think we've mm -hmm. probably got enough experience in the planning board to provide some recommendations there. Um, we've had experience with multiple developers of, of smaller buildings uh, yeah. in town. I think I think maybe take, letting the planning board take the first crack at that one would be pretty reasonable. Eli, I'm not sure how we get at this, but um, the question of 120 units, 157 units, mm -hmm. um, units that apply to the target of um, Safe Harbor, um, the developer provided certain numbers for what happens with the distribution of the units as proposed um, in terms of how many people would be living there and how many people in families with children would be living there and came up with a number, for instance, for schools of 30 um, students that would be attending um, the district schools. And the question that I'm trying to get at here is, um, and I'm not sure whether we can get this from other town managers or boards of selectmen, um, about how accurate those predicted numbers were. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, well, from our basis of our data, 30 is the number of students that will come with this project at 157 units, and then find out somehow, and I'm not sure whether it's through those boards of selectmen or town managers in the areas that, uh, the, that this developer in particular has worked, um, those numbers didn't pan out. Um, that there were 45 students who came into the schools. Because before we can talk to the schools about how would you deal with the impact of this number of students coming in, um, <clears throat> We have to have an idea of what that number is. And I'm not sure whether there are consultants who can say, oh yes, well, when you look at these types of projects over the state of Massachusetts, this is what the numbers look like. Um, we're relying on the developers numbers and we don't know how accurate they are. And so my question is, do we need a consultant for that? Or can we derive that information through Greg's conversation with town managers and John's and my conversations with boards of selectmen in the areas that this particular developer has worked. So, um, you, Brown? Uh, there are consultants out there that do that specifically. And I believe there is also um, a considerable and new, fairly new report or a fairly um, um, up to date report on MAPC's website about how many. Um, um, students are usually um, come from this type of development. So I've, I've read that some time ago. I haven't, I don't recall if it gave, um, what kind of numbers it gave, um, but I can, I can look that up, but there's definitely um, consultants that do exactly that type of peer review. So that would be a peer review yeah. service for I, May I? Mr. Chairman, um, I would, looking at the impact on the town um, from the developers' numbers and from the numbers that, that suggest themselves, um, the biggest impact on the town, it, fiscal impact on the town, is going to be in the schools. So if we have a consultant doing fiscal analysis, we absolutely need that consultant to be able to focus on how many students um, how many how many people how many student 
yeah, just how many students. So I wouldn't bother with a financial analysis that doesn't include that. Well, well the applicant did provide a, a methodology that they did to come up with their 30. I don't know how valid it is, but their methodology involved giving numbers from specific projects. I have no idea whether those projects are, in fact, cherry picked. Um, I think I they are. What, I'm I, sure I, mean, they, I, I certainly would. Yeah, the, but, well, they looked for communities that were similar. You're not going to get no, 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 no. no. When I say cherry situation. picked, I mean that they looked for developments that specifically did not have oh, seven students. Kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, we don't know that. And we, what, we do, what we do know about that data, Anne, is that if you go over those tables, that the uh, numbers in the tables are not accurate. Um, there is that. Um, because I, I went over and did the calculations, and the calculations don't work. Um, so it, it's probably just in terms of the way that they extended the ratios um, that there was some mistake. Because when you come down, through um, the actual number of, uh, of student age uh, mm -hmm. children and residents, um, that, those numbers seem to fit, but the, the ratios were way off on two of the projects, the one in Littleton, mm -hmm. and I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah. I okay, so, so, so Anne, it's your point is that the, probably the, the way we get at that, the, the preferred way we would get at that would be to test the fiscal management consultant with that as one of the things they chase down. Is, is that what Sue's referring to? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. I want to try and uh, uh, I feel like we're uh, dropping the re return on investment for additional time in tonight in this meeting. So I'd like to go back and collect up a few threads out of this and um, uh, schedule a meeting for next um, Tuesday, the 24th, and uh, say what we're going to cover in that meeting. Um, so coming out of this, this meeting so far, we've come up with the requests to FinCom, which Sarah Mellish is going to go and dispatch, um, requests regarding traffic management, environmental impact, and architectural to the planning board. Um, requests for environmental impact to the CONCOM, uh, all related to, to um, what questions we might want to ask of um, um, consultants um, that we would hire for this, this process, uh, except possibly with uh, the architectural aspect to the planning board, but let's set that aside. Um, and then uh, over the next uh, several days, um, Greg and um, John and uh, Jeff are going to talk to town managers and other boards of selectmen to engage and find out what other consultants experiences they've had. We'll reconvene on November 24th. We'll discuss the outcome of those discussions and um, start discussing our list of specific guidelines that we would like to provide to these particular areas of consultants. Does that uh, about capture it? Yes. Could we could we add DPW to the travel traffic? Sure. Sure. We can ask for input or questions from that. And you and Greg right. are going to get some more info on the water. Yeah. Perfect. All right. And the next meeting on November twenty fourth, which is next Tuesday, would be at six thirty. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, that went way longer and out of scope than I had planned, but there's some, we're, we're going to suffer through a few of these. Uh, let's move on to agenda item number five, COVID-19 update. Um, Greg, you want to start with that? I'm sure. So I think really the main focus here is just a really strong reminder to, to residents that we do have much stricter limits for the gatherings of people. So it's, it's a maximum of 10 people inside and it's a maximum of 25 outside on private residences. 
Um, we've ha we had some violations of that this this uh, or not this past Sunday, a week ago on Sunday, um, and some people are paying some pretty hefty fines because of it. Um, and so we just want to put that strong, strong reminder out to everybody. Um, I, I know it's hard. We've got the Thanksgiving coming up, and we're, we're we all are so. Uh, anxious and desirous of getting together with family and, and friends, but we really need to, to try to be mindful of those limitations and, and respect them um, so that we, we don't get ourselves uh, in a worse position. Um, there are some pretty scary infection rates going on in the country, you know, double digit uh, infection rates. Um, Massachusetts uh, was doing quite well. We were below 1%. We are now above 3% uh, in that infection rate, um, but we're not in the double digits. So we want to not see that go to that extent. Um, so really the main point here is to remind people, keep, keep wearing those face masks. That's the best thing we can be doing and don't have large gatherings. Um. <clears throat> So, um, <clears throat> any questions from board members? Um, I don't want to call out uh, uh, any particular details or individuals about uh, um, uh, the offenders last week, um, but any questions about process or um, public safety from um, board members? Thank you. All right, so the town's going to continue its communications push um, on this. Um, and um, I'll, I'll side with Greg stressing how important it is for members of the public to keep their pods as tight as possible. Um, all right, let's move on to. Item number six, uh, management of town website policy, updating the, the first reading. So I sent out a draft um, policy, which is pretty short. Um, and uh, since we are gonna treat this as possible first reading, I'll go ahead and give it a read. Um, so this is an M Manchester by the Sea website po up update policy governing um, the process by which uh, updates we expect and anticipate to be made to the um, town website. So definitions for the purpose of the policy, the website is considered to comprise two categories of contact general and content, general, municipal, and board or committee. Board or committee content refers to pages and content that are produced or managed by a particular board. For example, parks and rec page on the website would be considered to be managed by a parks and rec. General municipal contact and content refers to all other content on the site. And policy has got six elements to it. One, changes to board and committee content shall only be made by town staff upon written instruction from the chair of the board of committee with the approval of the board of committee. Change requests shall be CC'd to the town administrator. Um, two, changes to general municipal content shall only be made by under authorization by the town administrator. Town administrator may delegate authority to town staff as he or she sees fit for any given purpose. Three, town administrator may authorize town staff to make changes to board or committee content independently. Uh, four, the board of selectmen shall be notified when substantive changes are made to board or committee content and when substantive changes are made to municipal content. Notification in these cases should summarize the area that was updated but not include detailed enumeration of the changes. Five, any email addresses included on town website for town staff and volunteers must be town email addresses. No personal email addresses may, may be included as contact information. Six, for selectman has final review authority for any content on the website. And there's no state intent that this policy is. Um, three bullet items. One, to ensure that the Board of Selectmen is kept aware of and can manage substantive changes to the website. Two, to ensure that changes made by boards and committees are made with a consensus of those boards. And 
three to continue to authorize changes with as lightweight a process, uh, process as possible. It is not the intent of board selectmen to review every change before it's made, nor that they are notified of every trivial administrative change, only that they're made of significant changes to allow the opportunity to review if the board of selectmen feels it's necessary. So that's the um, uh, proposed policy. And I welcome any comments um, or proposed edits. Go for it. Eli, if I may. Yes, please, Becky. Um, I think it's very direct, concise. I think you covered it. That's it. I agree with Becky. Yeah. I agree with John. Jeff. I don't agree with anybody. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I have one, I'm just kidding. I, I, I have one question about policy item number one. How is that different than what we've already got in place? Other than the fact that it hasn't been written into a board policy. It has not been written into a board policy. And um, that's the part of the point of this exercise to make it clear that this is um, how we want things to go. I, I understand that, but my question is and remains, how is number one different than what's already happening? Well, I, have, uh, I haven't been necessarily CC'd on, on board and committee changes. And there have potentially been some cases where through miscommunication or uh, other um, circumstances, uh, boards were not aware of the full scope of changes that were being made. Um, this is intended to sort of stiffen up the process a little bit around that. So it's a requirement, a clear requirement that uh, this is the process that other boards go through. But the changes can be made as long as Greg is informed and if they're substantive changes, the Board of Selectmen is informed. The changes can be made prior to Greg's review or the Board of Selectmen's review. That is correct. With the approval of that particular board and in, with written um, instruction from the board chair, um, subject to item number six, that the Board of Selectmen has final review authority for any content on the website. The point is, we don't want to be involved in that process. We want people to, to be able to exercise their judgment, but we want to make it clear that if um, communication or change, which is completely out of line with the policy of the Board of Selectmen is put in place, we reserve the right to go and change it. Okay, um, one of the concerns and considerations that has been brought up about the website, Eli, is um, out-of-date content and um, a lack of review by committees of what's actually on their site. Um, and does this policy in any way address that? It does not. It would be easy to add um, uh, one very simple item, like an item seven says, um, uh, board and boards and committees um, are requested to or expected to review the content for their individual pages for um, uh, correctness uh, on a regular basis. Uh, if, if we're going to parse language on that, timely, because regular could mean, okay, every month we'll look at it. Um, and timely could mean, oh, those Halloween recommendations maybe should come down since it's after Thanksgiving. I, I'd make it monthly, just say at, at least I, once a month. I, I, I want it to be timely, John, because 
the, the concerns that have been raised that I've seen about the website is that there's there are things up there that are long expired. I mean, they've, they're expired and have started to uh, create that smell in the corner of the room. I think timely is reasonable. I think timely okay. is good to deliver it as a message to the individual boards and um, uh, the chairs of the boards. And um, if we get a complaint, we can ping the boards and say, hey, um, go and update this. I prefer that because there are some boards, there are some boards that, that don't meet on a monthly basis necessarily and probably don't need to. They meet once a quarter or something along those lines. So I will add um, some language around that um, and get it out to everybody and we can smith the language at the next reading, the second. Is that, that okay with everybody? That's good. 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 Yes. Yeah. Any other comments from board members? Any any comments from the public on this policy? Sarah, I, I, I just sure. asked if you are specific with with respect to when we need to review it. You want us to be specific about when you're going to need to review it? Yeah, we don't look at the websites. So we just need to understand what the parameters are. Well, Sarah, if you don't change your content, then, you know, there's not going to be a lot of need to review it. But if, but if content is changed, and particularly if it's timed content. I have, we don't, I'm chair of the FinCom and the ZBA, and we don't do anything with respect to the website. And we need to, we need to understand when. Okay, let me work on some language. Yeah. Kind of try to split the difference and we can address language around that um, at the second reading. Right. Eli. Yes, Mr. Uh, to Running Ridge Row. Um, I have a request that uh, the members of the planning board who are an elected body, be allowed to have, um, you know, a manchester.ma.us uh, email address published on the site so that they can be contacted individually. Okay, um, I'm gonna take, the, I'll take that up as a, uh, an issue that I'll address at some point. Um, uh, first, I have to gather a little bit more information from, town council and, and Greg before I bring that back before the board. And the last time we had a discussion about this um, uh, last meeting on this policy, um, I wanted to decouple uh, the notion of whether or not particular boards have email addresses from this policy. Uh, the two are actually independent. Um, the policy only needs to establish that there be no personal email addresses up there. Um, and as for whether particular boards um, have email addresses, their town email addresses, um, there are some um, you know, potential legal questions that I want to resolve before we commit one way or the other to the other that, about that. But we will discuss it at, at a later date. I, I'm interested to hear that Sarah's remark about not looking at the website. Is there anything we can do about getting board and committee minutes? Added in a timely fashion. Uh, yes, that's a regular instruction to the boards, which we will re reinforce. Excuse me, um, Eli, may I make a comment to that? Yeah. Um, timely is different for different committees and boards because they don't all meet as frequently as others. That's just sometimes that can impact if there are issues with minutes. Uh, just, just may I ask Becky, I don't know if you were meaning that for my... Um... I was, Sheila. 
edification. I hope this doesn't necessitate uh, a call <laughs> from JJ because I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm well aware that the boards don't meet all uh, that regularly. Um, however, many boards are missing meetings uh, minutes since April. I think really eight months is, is, a, is a bit long. Okay, I would just say not many, but perhaps there are some. The important ones like the finance committee are missing. Anyway, we don't need to. Your message is heard. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. My, All right. To my knowledge, the finance committee are up to date. Great, just let's get them on the website. Uh, so I'm, I'm, the message has been received. Uh, we'll follow up on it and I'm gonna move on um, now. So next meeting we'll have the second reading on this. Um, I'm gonna skip liaison project updates, moving on to the consent agenda item eight. Uh, we have board of selectmen meeting minutes from November 2nd and approval of non-resident parking fees at Singing Beach. That was a request to move um, to um, $35 from $25. Um, uh, any requests or comments on the consent agenda from board members? Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Mr. Round? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Bodmer Turner? Yes. Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. Correspondence uh, letter from Xfinity. Town Administrators. <laughs> Okay, I can keep this pretty brief, uh, a little more detail in, in my memo to you. Um, so the business promotion efforts are, are getting underway. Sonia and, and Erica Brown are working well with the merchants on, um, on those initiatives that you approved uh, using some of your donation funds. Um, so that's off to a good start and you'll be seeing some of that, uh, some of that work over the coming weeks. Um, holiday event, the, the, you know, the, the um, Santa and holiday stroll, a little different this year. It'll be spread out over uh, a long weekend rather than just one day. Uh, chamber and the merchants are, are working on that, as well as some, uh, some new lighting and decorating plans as well. Um, again, all of this is really designed to really underscore and, and to stress the, uh, the importance of supporting local, local merchants uh, this, this holiday season in particular. Uh, tree policy, just to give you an update, the Finance Committee had uh, quite a few questions on, on the tree policy and concerns about the uh, wider um, reach, you know, going out to that 11 feet. Um, obviously, in many of our village street areas, it's, um, that 11 feet is not a, a reality in terms of you're, you're well into someone's yard and, and some of the uh, narrower streets and uh, the houses and whatnot being right close to the, to the roads. Um, so we're gonna do a little more work on uh, trying to get a better sense of the inventory of trees that this would capture. Um, I will say that, that, that Chuck and DPW, Chuck Dam, DPW director, are feeling pretty good about the, the additional funds that were approved in this current year's budget. Um, you um, basically doubled the funds to the, to the tree account in this, uh, in this past, in the current year from past years. Um, and so far that's, that's doing quite well. Um, and we recall that we used to have a 10 foot rule rather than uh, the current five. Um, so more, more to come on that. Um, Finance Committee will be reviewing it a bit more when we provide them a little more information and then we'll uh, move forward hopefully with, um, with your approval of a, um, of a new policy. Uh, budget development work uh, well underway. Uh, we'll be presenting to you on the 7th at a joint meeting. I've been mentioned uh, earlier this evening, 
Finance Committee will join you on December 7th, and I'll be giving the preliminary presentation uh, for the, um, giving a presentation on the preliminary FY22 budget. And um, later on that month, there'll be a joint meeting with the school committee, and that'll really focus on um, the long range forecasting for school budgets and operations and um, where, where we think that will be all headed. So um, that, that should do me for now and uh, we'll take it from there. All right. Um, so uh, any questions from board members on the town administrator's report? Okay, uh, I have no other matters as may not have been reasonably anticipated by the chair. So I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's a motion by Ann Harrison, seconded by um, Becky Jakes. Any discussion? All in favor, Mr. Round? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Bodmer Turner? Yes. Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. Good night, folks. We'll see Good night. Now. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Eli. Everybody. Thanks, Eli. Good night.